White Noise, published 1985. This novel centers around the heaviest themes present in postmodern literature. Death, technology, consumerism, and the fear of it all, the whole enchilada. The author, Don DeLillo, expresses these themes through descriptions of actions, environments, and the events which bind all of them together. Yet what sets this book apart is its willingness for humor. This book is satire, and it jabs at society and what is to come with the lens of morbid over-exaggeration, of social trends, of governments, of individual characters and the like. But the author stated himself, This is a novel about fear, death, and technology. A comedy, of course. So let us journey into a world beyond where we shall dwell deep within the planted satire of white noise and analyze DeLillo's commentary on fear, consumerism, education, and family. In White Noise, DeLillo satirizes the use of advertisements and media by portraying it through Jack, seeing his daughter Steffi repeating the name of cars she has seen on ads when she uttered two clearly audible words, familiar and elusive at the same time, words that seem to have a ritual meaning, part of a verbal spell, or ecstatic chant. A long moment passed before I realized this was the name of an automobile. She was only repeating some TV voice. Toyota Corolla, Toyota Celica, Toyota Cressida. Page 148 to 149. Don DeLillo satirizes advertisements and how they influence people so much, especially children. Advertisements affect children at a young age because they are easily impressionable. As a matter of fact, most advertisements on children's programs are directly targeted for them, even if it's selling insurance or something that shouldn't be res the responsibility of a child. Though in real life, it is probably rare to walk in on your child saying various names from advertisements such as Fruit Loops, Toyota Corolla, or Pillow Pet in their sleep. Don DeLillo is using this exaggeration to display how Steffi was so influenced by the car ads that she was saying it in her sleep. When it comes to advertisements influencing a child, or just people in general, it is about having bright colors, a jingle that gets stuck in your head or a character. Something as simple as a bright blue car zooming across the screen can easily get a child's attention. Advertisements are pretty much unavoidable since it is everywhere, on the TV, your phone, billboards, and magazines. Don DeLillo's satire is effective because it displays the over-exaggerated influence commercials had on Steffi. DeLillo's opinion on advertisements makes you reconsider your view because sometimes you don't know the amount of impact advertisements have. Hi guys! Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Make sure to click that notification bell for more daily content for Papercraft Storytime. Next week, we'll be reviewing Things Fall Apart by Chinua Chebe. Stay tuned! Jack Gladney is a professor at the College on the Hill, the chairman of his own department, Hitler Studies. Jack is supposed to know everything about the subject, however, he doesn't even know any German. When Murray asks him why he wants to learn a language now, he says, I told him that there was a Hitler conference scheduled for next spring. Actual Germans would be in attendance. Using this quote, the Lilo is trying to make the point that professors don't have the necessary tools or knowledge to teach anymore. The only reason Jack would want to learn an important aspect of his curriculum is to not be embarrassed by others during one conference. Individuals are so obsessed with society's views on them that they would do anything to impress them instead of expanding their own knowledge. Dulu's use of satire in academics shows how society is academically regressing with time and technology.
Hello there. You didn't expect to see her this hour. Please, join me in my humble abode. So I may talk about Don DeLillo's white noise and the aspect of family. Family and family interactions in this novel are quite interesting topics. Not that they are full of life and unrest like in a nuclear sitcom family, but one that's supposedly written to parallel reality. But there's a fine line between satire and jumping the shark and ending up with something completely unbelievable for the audience. Yes, my opinions aside, the real commentary lies in the roles with which each and every one of them plays. The simplest way we can use a picture of Gladney family is with a single word, divorce. Jack, father of all these children, over a particularly long period of time, has kids as old as 14 and as young as 6, and all four of them were fostered between four wives in addition to another one from Babette's ex-marriage. And as a result, there are no traditional family bonding values seen in the stories and sitcoms. This family is distant, and what little time together to spend together is forced and unnatural. Whether it's Babette organizing the family to watch TV on Fridays, but everyone hates watching TV, so what's the point anyways? Or Jack and Heimrich watching a burning asylum while the immolated patient runs around screaming for help. Mind you, the youngest member is a six-year-old who has yet to speak and cries for days on end, yet while Jack nor Babette notices that Wilder is different from the rest, they fail to realize that there is something seriously wrong with him and rather than consult with a professional about his condition, they revere him as this god of innocence and ignorance which both of them desperately crave. To him, the little that is, family has become just a unit of life. Strangers living together with other strangers because they merely share the common thread of being related. So my question to you, the viewers, why would Delillo have such a dysfunctional family represent modern America? I've stated it before, the gladness is the epitome of the degraded meaning of what a family should represent, and I'm put to an extreme of what may become in our society. It's that or that Jack is just a really, really bad parent. Honestly, I don't know anymore. Characters in the novel have a very, very exaggerated sense of fear. Because of that, in the novel, fear acts as a major driving force that leads people to make stupid decisions. This is most clearly demonstrated through characters' obsession with dialogue. Dialogue, a medication that's supposed to have an impact of eliminating fear of that, holds a significant role in bringing an abrupt change to the novel plot and character development. For example, Babach, Jack's wife, who appeared to be fearless earlier in the novel, reveals her sexual relationship with the great man in exchange for his provision of dialogue. The sole reason of her affair was her fear of that. Jack's reaction to her affair is also very satirical. While paying a minimal attention to the fact that his wife has been cheating on him, Jack instead becomes very obsessed with that law which he believes to cure his fear of death. His fear of death has already been continuously empathized throughout the novel, especially after he was notified that he will die in 30 years due to his exposure to Nyanite. Although, knowing that Jack is already in his 50s, dying after 30 years is not very surprising but even very obvious, Jack's fear grows without a limit that he ends up attempting to kill the great man to become a killer instead of a dyer. 
Why? Isn't everyone going to die anyways? By illustrating how characters become more and more exaggerated and senseless throughout the novel, Delillo criticizes the society that is easily persuaded by, by very, very unreasonable fear.